So in thinking about innovation and creativity, I always have more questions than answers. And I, I can't even think about the concept of human progress without asking what if. We learn, adapt, and evolve together in this progress where we're always solving problems. But what if humans were unable to ask hypothetical questions at all? If critical thinking is what separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom, then how did we learn to push the limits? Did we see a rock rolling down a hill and say, what if I could take that concept and build my own tool to carry the things I need to survive with me? We evolved from monkey see, monkey do, to innovators. This is my third year working with What If in some fashion, and I'm always surprised by the responses that we get. If you get it, you love it. And, but at the same time, we still get feedback from some people who are uncomfortable with these ideas. It's too speculative often, or they can't move forward without more certainty in what we're talking about. And so I wanna talk about those people today. So I found two real barriers to thinking about the unknown, language and visual perception. So first, one of the most interesting stories I've heard was from this man named Fook Tron in his TEDx talk. He is a tattoo artist and a grammar enthusiast, and he talked about language and how it deeply influences how he and his family think about reality and possibility. He grew up in Vietnam for, for a short period of his life, and they moved as refugees to America. In the process, there was a lot of commotion, and they had to travel by bus. And so they boarded the first bus on their way out. And in, in the commotion, he became really upset and started to cry. So his parents said, okay, we'll wait. They waited for the next bus. Just a few moments later, the first one was hit with artillery fire. And so growing up with this knowledge that just by chance, his family survived and made it to America, he often wondered what would have happened had he had stayed on that bus and how the world would have been differently. And so I, what he realized eventually is that talking to his parents, they didn't understand this concept. He asked them how they felt about the what if and they responded with confusion. He didn't know at the time, but he was using a little piece of grammar known as the subjunctive. And the subjunctive is pretty elusive to me still, even after weeks of talking to people about it. But what I do know is that it's a mood that we use in language. It expresses uncertainty about some things. It expresses ideas that have not happened yet or could not even be possible. And so it's used often in Spanish, hardly at all in English, and never in Vietnamese. And so he didn't realize that as he had grown up speaking English, his parents, they could feel these ideas. They could feel the fear that something could have happened to them, but they had no language to express this idea. And this was mind blowing to me. So along with Fook, I have so many questions about what this means for culture. What do we do when a language has barriers that we can't get through to get others on, our, on, this, on board with us, with our ideas? And so my second barrier, we'll switch, switch gears really quick, is visual perception. And this is talking about reality versus possibility, the indicative versus the subject. Sorry, I'm going back. But Fook, Fook would talk to his parents, trying to explain to them the difference. He could say, if it rained today, we would have gone to the beach. That's subjunctive. On the other hand, he, he could say indicatively that it did rain today, so we did not. And if you can see the differences, we can talk more about that later. So moving on, we see these real barriers within our culture and our paradigms that keep us from exploring the unknown. And so what happens when visual perception is also bound? Many of us are familiar with this optical illusion. And it's surprising that I didn't know, um, it's surprising that depending on where you grew up, you see this differently. And so if you grew up in America, you might be deceived at first and think that the, the side with outward bending angles at the bottom is longer than the other. And if you grew up in foraging groups or in the Kalahari Desert, you would see that they're actually the same size. And so what researchers found in the 1960s is that this is because of our, our visual perception. So we as Americans, we grew up in boxed rooms. We see corners, we see squares, and we adapted to that. And so as you see, with the outward facing prongs on the end, that's three dimensions. And we, 
we think of that line in three dimensions and it looks further away to us. So then it looks like it's longer. And this is surprising information because it's, we're, we're looking at the same image. And so how did we learn to perceive converging lines in three dimensions? This example, along with many other studies, was used by anthropologist Joe Henrik to disrupt our understanding of, of human nature. He believes our mind has a capacity to mold around our culture and our settings, which is opposite to how we usually think about it, where human nature um, is then creating our culture and our responses to it. So this brings us to my last point. It's often easy to dismiss what if questions that seem too optimistic, too hypothetical, because we have this distrust in each other, that we can, we can theorize as much as we want. We can ask what if often, but if we don't trust each other because we are each inherently self-interested, then all of these systems are vulnerable to being taken over. And so as community members here, as activists, as educators, we're charged with making the world better. So how do we do that when the, there are real barriers? And that's what I would like you to all think about today as we're talking to each other. Um, what, what is happening in your brain that you are not aware of right now? And so if our quirky anthropology and our culture and our perception and our language and even our grammar can shape our minds in ways that we aren't aware of, then what if human nature isn't stagnant? And what if we are, are really able to cross these barriers together? Joe, after he finished his studies, um, he was left with only a few thoughts, and that's that the most interesting things about culture may not be the observable things that we do, the rituals, eating preferences, codes of behavior, and the like, but in the way that these things mold our most fundamental conscious and unconscious thinking and perception. So what keeps you from asking what if?